I hope everybody can hear me. I'm not sure how good my connection here is in Brazil, and there's a lot of background noise going. Good. Thank you for that. Um, it's my pleasure and honor to introduce Dr. Michael Romero. Um, he's a professor at Tufts University. Um, Michael did his undergraduate work and, um, and completed his degree at Swarthmore. Uh, he went on then to do a PhD where he worked with um, Robert Sapolsky at Stanford University, and then went on to the University of Washington where he completed a postdoc with Dr. John Wingfield. Um, it, was, it was at that point that I met Michael. Um, Michael and I became friends and, and really close colleagues um, early, early on in our careers. I was still a PhD student. Michael was pounding away on his postdoc and we overlapped in the Arctic of Alaska, both of us working on vertebrate stress responses. Um, Michael has focused his career on the vertebrate stress response, especially in wild and free living animals. His research is highly comparative. He's published numerous papers on birds, reptiles, um, mammals, amphibians, and he's really been an exemplar of scientific discovery, mentorship, service um, in the field of comparative endocrinology. He's had and, is con and continues to have a very prolific career as an educator and a researcher. Last time I was trying to count his uh, manuscripts that are published, um, I stopped at 150 and decided, okay, he's produced over 100 peer-reviewed publications. Good for you, Michael. But these are very, very seminal works in the field. Um, he's published more than 30 reviews and books cha book chapters. And possibly his greatest contribution to the field that I can see is that he compiled what we know of stress physiology and free living vertebrates into a, a, a foundational book entitled Tempests, Hawks, Predators, and People, Stress in Wild Animals and How They Cope. Um, this book for the students and postdocs in my lab has become essentially their Bible. You can open it up and you can get a context for what you're studying and the implications of what you're studying and possibly even to go, where to go next um, in the research that you're doing. It's an incredible res resource to laboratories that's utilized around the world. Um, in addition to his research, Michael's shown a tremendous commitment to training the next generation of scientists. He's mentored numerous uh, graduate students, undergraduates, postdocs, and um, in addition, uh, this work has not gone unnoticed. Um, he's received recent awards. Um, for example, in 2018, he received prestigious presidential award for excellence in science, mathematics, engineering, mentoring by the White House and was named a Grass Traveling Lectureship Fellow. Um, Michael, thank you so much for um, giving your time to share the research that you do with, with this group. The plan was for Michael to travel from Massachusetts to Arizona in May of 2019 and give this lecture in person. We've gone through numerous iterations as to how we're going to schedule it. And finally, we threw up our arms and said, what the heck, let's do Zoom, everybody else is doing it. So without taking up any more of your time, Michael, I'll, I'll, I'll let you take the stage. Thank you very much. Well, that's great, thank you. Everybody can hear me okay? Excellent, uh, thank you very much, Lauren. This is uh, wonderful. I'm, I'm gonna try to share my screen here and hopefully start my talk, but at least you now you can see my title. Uh, it's, it's been a, it's a real pleasure, but I hope that you uh, bear with me. This is the first time I've tried to do a, a lecture from my basement. Uh, so, <clears throat> well, well, hopefully it'll go well. I, I'm really missing seeing all of you guys in person and being able to chat and, and, and make sure that what I'm saying actually makes sense. Uh, before I start, I just want to point out the, uh, the choice of my background here. There's going to be a quiz at the end of my talk to figure out what it is that's behind me and why it's important and relevant to my talk. Okay? All right. So, scared, cold, and hungry. Stress from the Arctic to the equator. So as Lauren sa has said, I spent essentially my entire career trying to understand stress. And I feel like I've mostly failed, but I've been trying to come up with a, 
a good way of defining stress, because I think it's important at the very beginning of any talk on stress for people to define what it is they're actually trying to say. And this is the only, and probably the best definition I've ever come across to explain stress. Oh, I, I should, I, this is why I did this. I have so many people to thank, and I write, like to get this out of the way early because I always forget at the end. But I have a huge number of people in my lab that I need to thank, former, current grad students. I have a number of wonderful collaborators and funding us. All of the, almost all of this work has been funded by the National Science Foundation. Okay, definition of stress. You guys can read this. Okay, so this is a, a definition that you're probably all familiar with. And I think it sums up really nicely what it is we think about stress. The problem with this definition is it includes words and concepts like feeling, like desire, and deserving. These are words that are incredibly difficult to define. And I have a little uh, story. When some of the work that I was doing up in Alaska, when, when Lauren was up there too, I, I spent some time with the Inupiat who live up in Barrow. And I heard from some of them that the word that they use for scientist when translated literally means one who measures things. I think that's a wonderful definition of a scientist, but I challenge any of you to measure feelings. Maybe the poet has been able to do that, but not scientists very well. Desire, deserving, these are not words that science can really get a handle on because we really can't measure them. So we have to use a different definition of, of, of stress. But when we were <clears throat> thinking about stress, we really think about it in terms of sort of this traditional way of thinking about things. And for, the, for many, many years, uh, people have been working in stress and they came up with this model. And the model, I like to call it the traditional model. And the idea is that there's an animal in a state of dynamic equilibrium. And then something from the environment, a noxious stimulus, what we call a stressor, serves to disrupt that dynamic equilibrium. And one of the things that we've discovered is that the, one of the things that uh, sort of make a stressor a stressor are things that are unpredictable and uncontrollable. Now, this individual animal is in deep trouble if this continues to disturb its dynamic equilibrium. And so there are a suite of adaptive responses that we call the stress response that serve to reestablish that dynamic equilibrium. Now, most of us, when we use the concept and use this, the, the word stress, are really not using it in this context. Because when we talk about, oh, school is stressing us out, or we're have, under a lot of stress right now, this is what we're really describing. We're describing where the adaptive response or the stress response itself serves to disrupt the dynamic equilibrium. It is more powerful than actually compensating for the stressor itself. And most of the time, people have now call that chronic stress. But a lot of my work has been trying to understand exactly how these two things balance, how the adaptive response helps animals to survive. So thinking about it in more detail, we have a stressor. The stressor is detected by the animal, and somehow we have to get to survival. So this bird right here is being stressed by this eagle. How is it going to detect this and get to the point of survival? We know a lot about this now. The first step is what I like to call a discrimination or determination function that takes place in the brain. So the first thing that has to happen is that the animal has to decide that that stimulus is, in fact, a stress stressor. Let me give you one of my favorite examples that illustrates this process. This was a study done in back in the, in the 1970s in which uh, scientists, well, it was a bunch of Norwegian uh, soldiers that were being trained to be paratroopers, so learn how to jump out of airplanes with, with uh, parachutes. And they took these young men to the top of the tower to train them, and they pushed them off. And they measured their stress hormones. And as you probably uh, uh, believe, their stress hormones were sky high. But interestingly, on day two, their stress hormone was a little bit lower. And by day three, they essentially had no response whatsoever. It was the exact same stimulus. They were being taken to the top of the same tower, being pushed off that tower the same way. And yet 
a first time they have a response and the second time they didn't. Why? Because there's this discrimination determination function in the brain that's saying, ah, this was a stressor, but now three days later, we've learned that we're not going to die. This is not going to kill us. It's actually not a stressor anymore. Okay. So that's the determination and discrimination function. Once it gets past that, once the brain makes that determination, a suite of things are initiated. One of them is catecholamine release. And this is the classic fight or flight response. And the fight or flight response includes two different uh, major effects. One of them is sympathetic activation, and the other is metabolic mobilization. And both of this part of the fight or flight response are well known to help in survival. At the same time, but lasting a little bit longer in time, is glucocorticoid release. And these are the glucocorticoid hormones. And they have a huge number of very bewildering effects that take place in the body. They help mobilize uh, energy. They can alter behavior. They can inhibit reproduction. They can both activate and inhibit the immune system, depending upon you know, what's going on. And all of these feed into both permissive actions, where it makes the catecholamine release work longer and better, and also different inhibitory, stimulatory, and preparative effects that all seem to help survival. Now, this was sort of the state of the field when I was in graduate school and getting ready to leave. And in many ways, this is still what many people in the field are still looking at as the model and how they think about stress. But as I started thinking about doing a postdoc, I wanted to ask, is this same system functioning the same way in wild animals? Because all of this was worked out in either humans or primarily laboratory species, like, like white lab rats. And one of the things that we started to find is that it's not as simple. And one of them are these normal variations and responses that you see throughout the, the time. And as Dean Smith once pointed out, is a um, a famous basketball coach, said, if you treat every situation as a life and death matter, you'll die a lot of times. So in other words, you have to vary your responses. Not everything needs the same response. And early on, we discovered this phenomenon in white crown sparrows. And there are three things that immediately jump out at you when you look at this graph, which is a graph of corticosterone or the glucocorticoid levels in birds over the course of the year. These initial, these bottom lines with the, with the solid, this is your baseline levels. What happens right when the animal is interacting and living on its own without being stressed. And these upper levels are those taken after 30 minutes of holding these animals in a bag and stimulating their stress response. And the first thing you see is that you get this really nice increase in corticosterone levels. And that's what we typically call the stress response. The second thing you see, though, is that it varies greatly over the course of the annual cycle. So when these birds are breeding, they have much higher levels of, of baseline corticosterone and even higher levels of stress-induced le uh, uh, glucocorticoids. And that's much different than the same species at different times of the year. Uh, this was essentially, I don't know about unknown, but underappreciated from the biomedical literature because they always kept their white lab rats on 12-12 light cycles and never saw this kind of variation over the course of the year. But the third thing, and the thing that really bothered me as a graduate, as a postdoc when I was first discovering these data, is this. So during the pre-basic molt, these birds are essentially failing to have any stress response at all. It's the same stimulus. It's me catching them and holding them. I'm sure that these birds think they've just been caught by a predator and are about to be eaten. And when you do this in the breeding season, they have this huge response. And when you do this during molt, nothing. So I just spent my entire graduate career being told that glucocorticoids were incredibly important to survival and that if you weren't able to secrete them, you were going to die. And here, we had naturally individuals that were failing to have any stress response whatsoever, and they were surviving just fine. What was going on here? So starting to think, huh, maybe that traditional model is not as good as we used to think. Another example of this is in the brown lemming. 
And the brown lemming uh, is lives throughout the Arctic. But the ones that we were studying were up here in Barrow, the farthest north point in Alaska. And when we collected, again, seasonal data from the brown lemmings, we found something really interesting. So here's the response in males in both June and July, much lower levels than females. They have a very mild response over the first 30 minutes, but statistically it is an increase. But then we look at the females. They have higher levels in June and they have really high levels in July. For those of you who are corticosterone aficionados, you can see that yes, these are up around 3,000 to 4,000 nanograms per mil. It's still in the literature that I can see the highest levels ever measured in a mammal. So what's going on here? Why are females so different in June and July? You think that's, you know, that's not a huge amount of time. But if you look at what's happening in the Arctic, huge changes are actually taking place in the Arctic between June and July. So here's a picture in June uh, up near Barrow. And what you see is all of the snow starting to melt out. And all of these lemmings are underneath these snowpacks where they've been all winter. Uh, this, the lemmings are too small to hibernate. So they're active all year round. And we know that because as the snow melts out, we can see these nests that they built for themselves to stay warm. And underneath the snow, you can see that they built all of these tunnels that they used to get between different grass places where they can eat. So we know that they're living underneath the, uh, the snow. Uh, they're also using the snow in June as protection, especially from aerial predators, because the tundra up here is far too... Uh, there's too much permafrost, so they can't burrow. And the only way that they can escape from predators is to actually run through the grass. And I'll show you a picture of that in a second. Here's a picture of the Arctic tundra, however, in July, just six weeks later. And you can see all the snow is gone. There's nothing for these lemmings to hide under. And the only way they can do so is to build these tunnels, that, uh, tunnel pathways through the grass where they can run back and forth very, very quickly and try to escape from predators. Well, and lemmings, when their lemmings are high and high density, all the predators know that this is the place to be. And so one of their main predators is the snowy owl. And snowy owls will build their nests in the Arctic tundra as well. And one of the things they eat are brown lemmings. And this is one of the snowy owl nests that we found one year. And you can see, here's the chicks that are starting to grow. Here's one of the eggs. And all around their nest, stacked like cordwood, are all the brown lemmings that mom and dad killed that are ready for the chicks to eat and grow. It's, you know, this is astounding. This particular pair, this, this male and female, had 10 eggs, hatched all 10. Uh, three of the chicks died in a storm about uh, three weeks later, but managed to get seven chicks all the way to fledging and adulthood. So mom and dad were feeding, catching enough lemmings to feed essentially nine full-size birds near the end of this, and they fledged all of those birds. Really, really good hunters. So we think that what's going on here is that these are the females in June when they have plenty of cover, and they're not really being faced with such intense predation pressure, whereas here, the females in July are faced with that predation pressure. So same time, very similar times in the year, but really, really different responses. And in, this is, not, remember, these are not females that have been killed or hunted by the snowy owls. These are just in the neighborhood where snowy owls are hunting. Okay, so the thing is, is that as Lily Tomlin once said, reality is the leading cause of stress among those in touch with it. And that's sort of what's happening with those lemmings. You know, the reality is that they're being hunted. But reality can it be also in a different way. And that is, we like to think of birds and animals reproducing in wonderful conditions. But conditions change. This is one of my favorite pictures. Uh, it's a picture I took. I, I like to call it the find the nest shot. Because somewhere in this bush is a nest of a bird. I can't even find it anymore. And I took the picture. I know that nest is there because here's my telephoto and you can see her sitting on her nest with all of this snow attached. So <clears throat> one of the questions that we had when we were up in the Arctic, you know, is weather, is this kind of stuff really stressful? I mean, 
when you read the textbooks, they say, you know, one of the classic things that creates stress in, in, in wild animals is bad weather. Okay, well, this is bad weather. Does this bird under stress? Well, we know, <clears throat> well, let me say that this is the, the tundra near Barrow uh, in late, mid to late June. And I want you to pay real attention to these uh, telephone poles because this is what this, the tundra looked like three days later. Massive storm rolling in. So is this weather stressful to these wild animals? It was certainly stressful to me, but was it stressful to them? Well, in the laboratory, if we model this, we see that weather conditions or what simulated weather is stressful. So on the top graphs, we have heart rate, which is an uh, index then of the fight or flight response. In the bottom, we have corticosterone levels. And the first thing we did was to blast them with cold air. So here's the uh, picture of the portable air conditioner that we just used to blast cold air at the birds. And this was stressful to them. They increased their heart rate and they had a very high increase in their corticosterone levels. We then also subjected them to rain. And in this case, what we did is we filled this upper bucket full of water. This is a standard garden timer. And so we didn't even have to enter the room for the water to all of a sudden drain into these two buckets. And these buckets have holes punched in the bottom and would then rain on top of the two bird cages underneath. And when we simulate rain, we see an increase in corticosterone, we see an increase in heart rate. With you do rain and just a regular wind, we see the response, and even rain and cold air, we see the response. So certainly in the laboratory, these birds are highly stressed by the kinds of, of things that we see in weather. What happens in the field? Well, we were fortunate in that some of our, our um, field sites were right close to a NOAA weather station that was taking every uh, four to six minutes the temperature, wind speed, precipitation, and humidity. And all of these we tested against the uh, glucocorticoid responses in the birds. What I'm gonna show you today is the data from temperature. And here's what we see. This is the Lapland longspur. That's the bird we were looking at. The reason that it's white is because this is all snow behind it. And this is when they were breeding and starting the breeding season. And the white circles were their initial levels, right when we caught them, aren't so indicative of baseline corticosterone levels and the red triangles are their stress-induced. And notice that there's absolutely no um, correlation, that even as the temperature got colder and colder, I mean, we're getting all the way down to minus 11, minus 12 Celsius, and the birds just don't seem to care. They're not stressed by the, the, the temperature itself, and they're not really stressed by anything that we're, the, any, uh, temperature or weather conditions in their environment. So in fact, you know, here was a highly relevant stressor. The traditional model would tell us that this is an incredibly important uh, stressor for these birds, and yet the birds in their natural habitat don't seem to care. Now, are they sensitive to uh, weather at all? The answer is yes, because when we repeated this experiment a, little, a couple months later, when they're undergoing their molt, so the same uh, species, but now all the snow is gone. They've already finished reproducing. And now, as temperatures got lower, you see both an increase in their baseline corticosterone levels and an increase in their stress-induced levels. So now they're highly sensitive to the weather conditions that they're facing. Even though, I might point out, the worst temperature that we got was zero, not minus 11, minus 12. So the conditions themselves are significantly better, but they are responding to whether or not the temperatures are different, and they did not during the breeding season. There was nothing in the traditional model that could help explain these data. And, and also, just thinking about how different, a different species reacts to different uh, habitats, and especially latitude. So this is some work I did with uh, Brian Walker and, and uh, John Wingfield, in which we caught the same species, the Lapland longspurs, at Tulik Lake, which is in central um, uh, north slope of Alaska, a little higher up, which is a, a significantly different type of tundra in Barrow, which is some of the data I just showed you. And then we also looked even higher, just shy of 80 degrees uh, north latitude at Thule in Greenland. And what we found was that, again, birds had very different responses. So they all had the same baseline levels, but at Tulik, they had a modest increase to our capture, 
In Barrow, they had a slightly more elevated, and in Thule, a much bigger elevation in responses. And so only difference here is, is both latitude and habitat type, but it's the same stimulus, which is us catching and holding them, but the context of where these birds are living can have a huge impact. All right, so those are kind of acute responses, but also, you know, what about these responses to chronic stress? This is again the traditional model about how these adaptive responses start to disturb the dynamic equilibrium themselves. It is the same thing that we're seeing in white lab rats also occurring with wild animals. So, you know, one of the things we've been you know, talking about responses to chronic stress, I love Henry Kissinger's quote there cannot be a stressful crisis next week because my schedule is already full. Right? So lots of people are suffering from or are experiencing chronic stress. How do, what are wild birds, what are wild species doing with this? One of the ways we tried to get after this is using uh, heart rate monitors to, to use as an index of the fight or flight response. And so we would take these heart rate monitors in starlings and try to implant them ex right at capture. So we catch them in the field put in the heart rate monitor right there in the field, bring the animal into the laboratory and monitor its changes in its acclimation to captivity using the introduction to captivity as the chronic stressor that, uh, that the bird is exposed to. And when we do that, so we use uh, our controls, our long-term captives. So they've been in captivity for several months. And when we do that, we see very low levels of heart rate right around 350, 380 beats per minute, that are pretty stable over the course of several days. But these newly caught birds, just brought in from the wild, have already elevated heart rates at 12 hours. Now we didn't measure them prior to 12 hours because it was a surgery to implant those heart rate monitors we needed the anesthesia to wear off. So these are the earliest we could take uh, unadulterated data. But one of the fascinating things about these data is that by 24 hours, certainly, and certainly by 30 hours, this increase in heart rate is returned to normal. And so the question we had was, are these animals already acclimating? Is there no such thing as chronic stress in these animals and being introduced to captivity? Because they seem to be coping just fine. Well, the answer is they really aren't. So when we continued to do this, but looked at a startle re response. So we'd walk up to, to the door, open it, and quickly shut it. And when our long-term captives, we see the classic startle response in heart rate at one and a half days after captivity. And that response is almost gone in our short-term birds. At three and a half days, it's still completely gone. Even by a week later, we are getting a very nice startle response in our long-term captive controls and almost no response in the birds that have just been introduced to captivity. And so this tells us that they are not coping well with being brought into captivity. And one of the things, if you had this kind of response in the wild, a, a chronically stressed wild animal in the wild, it'd be very difficult to escape from predators, et cetera. It's, that's what the, the fight or flight response is really important for. And we know that this is not just a, um, a short-term effect because when we look at glucocorticoid receptors in the hypothalamus, so here's the paraventricular nucleus, and you look at higher magnitude, and you can see the staining for the glucocorticoid receptors. But what you see is that the relative expression in the, in the hypothalamus controls is a lot higher than those that were undergoing chronic stress. And so why is this important? Because the glucocorticoid levels in the hypothalamus are thought to be one of the prime regulators of the negative feedback response. So if we're losing receptors in the hypothalamus, that means that the negative feedback is also going to be damaged. Another question we asked, in, in sort of coming from this work of the, in chronic stress, is, is there a common endocrine profile for a chronically stressed wild animal? The biomedical literature is pretty clear. When you have a chronically stressed animal, or really a chronically stressed white lab rat, it has elevated levels of glucocorticoids. And so it is essentially in biomedicine has become almost a diagnostic. When you see high levels of glucocorticoids, that must be a chronically stressed animal. Is that true in wild animals? And so students and I did a literature search 
and we found 216 studies that had actually applied chronic stress to individuals and then looked to see whether or not they had a response in their glucocorticoids. And we were comparing very different studies on very different species, everything from white lab rats to wild um, crocodiles and <clears throat> different kinds of um, responses. So just to make it simple, we just asked each, for each study, did the glucocorticoids decrease? Did they not change or did they increase? And what we found was fascinating. So just look at the baseline levels first. So the average score, we found 148 studies where they looked at, at manipulated chronic stress or applied chronic stress and looked at glucocorticoid levels. And the average score was a 2.4. So somewhere between no change and an increase. So this sort of makes sense in terms of what the biomedical literature was telling us. But a look at that yellow line. That's the standard deviation around that number. And what we really saw at the baseline was that the, the vast majority of them increased in glucocorticoid levels, but a substantial minority, almost a third of the studies had no change. And a, and a small number even showed a complete decrease in the baseline glucocorticoids, which is, that's why these things are so wide. And it was, the situation was even more confusing when you looked at stress-induced glucocorticoids. Again, 80 different papers did this. The average score was a 2.17, so just barely over no change. And look at the, at, the, at the variability associated with that. And why is that variability so high? Because we had 24 studies that showed no change, 34%, 34 studies decreased, and 34 increased. Almost exactly, not just no change, but an inability to predict anything. The reason why this average is slightly over 2 and 2.17 is because we weighted each study on the basis of sample sizes that they used and whether or not they were wild animals or exposed in a laboratory, et cetera. But bottom line is, is that you know, the take-home message, there is no consistent response. If you catch an animal and find that it has high levels of glucocorticoids, you cannot conclude that it's chronically stressed. And if you see low levels that are lower, you cannot conclude that that animal is not chronically stressed. There's nothing from the literature that allows you to make that prediction. Totally different than what we are taught through the traditional model. And it gets even worse. So we think about, all I've, all I've talked about now is sort of the initiation of the stress response, but what about the utility of these responses? What are the downstream effects of them? As Hans Selye said, it's not the stress actually that kills us, it's our reaction to it. And a, quote, a wonderful quote by Jenny Craig suggests, well, I think probably the main reason people overeat is stress. So let's look at this. This is glucocorticoids. They're supposed to re regulate glucose levels. Uh, let's see what they actually do in, in the wild. And so this is the figure, just a little bit of background. This is the figure that you would see in almost any textbook about what stress does in glucose levels. So the stressor is applied to an individual, and the first response within seconds is you get the re release of epinephrine, the classic fight or flight response. And epinephrine's main function is to uh, break down glycogen through glycogenolysis to create um, glucose for the body to use. On a slightly longer time scale, we get the glucocorticoids release, and they have three primary missions. One is to make this process work better and longer, so enhance glycogenolysis. They also decrease peripheral usage in order to get higher blood glucose levels into the blood. And then finally, on the time scale of hours and even days, you can start getting the breakdown of other substrates like fats and proteins to get gluconeogenesis. So this is what you see in the textbook. And I went back and I looked at some of these early papers that, were, that generated this dogma. And here's one of the papers that I found from 1962 by Monk and Koritz. And so just look at the blood glucose levels here. In the controls, the blood glucose levels increased slightly. But when they in injected cortisol, you see this major increase in blood glucose levels. And these were one of the reasons why they were called glucocorticoids, because they regulated glucose. But two things about this graph. First of all, is when do you start seeing this increase? Look at this. It's about an hour after the injection. This is not an immediate response. These, these levels are not increasing in order to help you survive an acute stressor. This is a more long-term response. And the second thing is this. 
These were all done in fasted animals. Now, fortunately, when the first time I found this paper, uh, Alan Monk was still alive. And so I gave him, a, and still working. So I gave him a call and asked him about this. And he said, well, of course we use fasted animals. If we use fed animals, then we'd be dealing with all the postprandial, the post-eating glucose that's flooding into the bloodstream. So we wanted to get rid of that. And I said to him, well, that makes perfect sense. I understand why you did that. But when I'm out in the field, I don't see fasted animals. I see animals that are always foraging. And so what happens when you add glucose, uh, add glucocorticoids or stress to, a, to an animal that's fed? We know what it looks like in a fasted animal, but what about a fed animal? And the answer is really interesting. We did this in, in our birds, and when they're fasted, we see the classic response that people have shown in all the biomedical literature, an increase in blood glucose levels, and a little bit faster than in the mammals, about half an hour rather than an hour, but a nice standard uh, response. But in those fed birds, they're higher levels because they've been fed, and no increase in blood glucose levels whatsoever. So it makes you start to wonder whether or not the traditional models even correct that glucocorticoids are involved in glucose regulation, at least in non-fasted animals. So is this a uh, figure from your textbooks? It may be completely wrong, especially when you're looking at, at non-fasted animals. Another possible thing that was a problem with us is just the utility of these acute responses on looking at these downstream effects. And we asked this question, is, is there a coordinated response across different tissue types? And, or do tissues respond differently to the same steroid signal from the plasma? So let me say this a little differently. We have two possible hypothetical relations. So th this might be six different individuals and looking at the glucocorticoid receptor levels in those tissues. And one of the possibilities is that in every single tissue, individual one who had the highest level in all these tissues, and individual two who has the lowest level in all these tissues. And that would mean that as each of these individuals is flooded with glucocorticoids, so individual one is gonna be more sensitive to that hormonal signal, and individual two will be relatively less sensitive. So that's one uh, possible relationship. The other is on the right-hand side where you see that there's no relationship between tissues at all. And that even though this individual had the highest levels in, say, the liver, it might have the lowest levels in fat and intermediate levels in muscle, whereas the individual two might have very different patterns. So what do we see when we actually look at this? So one of my graduate students in a real tour de force, Christine Latin, looked at glucocorticoid receptors and mineralocorticoid receptors in 72 different birds and 11 different tissues. And what we found was that, yes, tissues are correlated, but in the glucocorticoid receptors, when the statistics only explain about 6% of the variance, so very little of the variance is explained. And furthermore, there's no significant pairwise correlations. So this is the figure that, I, that we're showing, that each one of these points is, a, is one of the tissues that we measured, and the line is that pairwise comparison, and the thickness of the line indicates how, how well they're correlated. And in no, none of these were actually statistically significant. And that includes some tissues that you would think would be highly correlated. For example, bib skin and belly skin, no correlation. Or even subcutaneous fat and omental fat, two different fat pads, no correlation whatsoever. The situation is slightly better for the mineralocorticoid receptor, which is the other uh, receptor for glucocorticoids, but in, because in this case, it explains 8% of the variance. And there's also two significant correlations in this case. One is the difference between the brain and the hippocampus, and that sort of makes sense because they're both in the brain, but the other is between the brain and the kidneys. And I have no idea why the brain mineralocorticoid receptors would be correlated with kidney mineralocorticoid receptors. Makes no sense to me. Suggests it's probably just a spurious uh, correlation. But in the end, what we're seeing is that this response where, we, this, where everybody has been sort of assuming that we have high responders, low responders, there's very weak support for this. In fact, the support is so weak that I would argue that basically we have no support for this whatsoever. And that this is what is really happening 
in most species. Now think about that. That means that the same hormonal signal will have a different impact in this tissue than in this tissue in this animal relative to its peers. All right. So what's, what do we know so far? So I came into this field thinking that we had the traditional model of stress and it explains so much. We've been working on it for 80 years. But I feel realizing that, first of all, your stress is not my stress and my stress isn't always my stress. It all varies in a horrible mess. Second of all, what really is chronic stress? Can we even tell? And were glucocorticoids misnamed? Maybe they don't have anything to do with glucose regulation much at all, except in, in very uh, specific situations where animals are not being fed enough. And finally, is there even a thing we can call a stress response? Or is it completely different upon, with different individual tissues? And each tissue is responding in its own way. So thinking about all of these problems with the traditional model, there's been a couple of attempts to try to solve a lot of these problems. So where do we go from here? And one thing that I do know is, as somebody said, why stress tomorrow when you can stress today? So I've been, ever since I've discovered a lot of these data, I've been stressed, trying to figure out how to make sense of it. So we have three now models of stress. I spoke a lot about the traditional model, it was laboratory based and it focuses on this concept of predictability and controllability of stressors. About 30 years ago, there was the um, allostasis was introduced as a concept. This is a, a model that was originated in human clinical medicine and in a seminal paper uh, by McEwen and Wingfield was adapted for use in ecology. And allostasis focuses heavily on energy input versus energy expenditure. And I'm not going to talk much about allostasis at all today. I'm happy to talk to with somebody else at some other time. And then about uh, 10 years ago, uh, some students and I uh, proposed the reactive scope model. And this was an idea of how to integrate both the ecology that's coming and the ideas from allostasis and also the physiology from the traditional model. And that's why in the last bit of my talk, I'm going to just talk a bit about what that model is. So here's the basic model. And what we're looking at is physiological mediators as part of the stress response over time. And we basically have these mediators in four different ranges. We do know that if some of these mediators are not present at high enough concentrations, the animals, it, it's uh, lethal. And so at a certain point, we have what we call homeostatic failure if the levels are not high enough. Above homeostatic failure, we have uh, <clears throat> the levels of our mediator that are present normally at normal times of the day. And so they can vary circadian fashion, which is the thickness of this gray bar, and they can also vary over the course of a year where you see big seasonal changes in these, in these levels. And then this is at rest, and we know that animals have to go out and forage. That's a very predictable thing. We know we have to go out and forage. And so there's also an increase in mediators we go out and so we can have another bear, um, line here. And all of this, this area between the homeostatic failure and the top of this range, we would call predictive homeostasis. These are events that an animal knows are coming, they're predictable, they know how to deal with it, no fuss, no must, no problem. And then an emergency comes along. And in an emergency, we need to get this physiological mediator higher. And so that ends up being into what we call the reactive homeostasis range. And the reactive homeostasis then is the responses to that emergency. But again, these emergencies happen all the time. You know, a predator starts to chase you, you get away. So all of these things are part of what we call the normal reactive or normal reaction scope of the animal. If levels get too high, however, then we go into homeostatic overload. And this is when the physiological mediator itself become shifts from being a helpful to surviving day-to-day um, -day events to causing problems itself. Okay, so just you know, showing you that the data actually are behind this idea of this model. I showed you this seasonal rhythm of glucocorticoid levels before, and this is what we use to model our seasonal changes in predictive homeostasis over time. <clears throat> 
All right, so what can we use as the y-axis? But there's all kinds of examples of the physiological system. So we can use various things from the immune system, the HPA axis, cardiovascular system, central nervous system, behavior, et cetera. And so one of the things we can just talk about a little bit is just using glucocorticoids, the HPA axis as the example for what is going on with this model. So the idea is that an animal is, is minding its own business, is faced with a stressor, it increases its mediator, say glucocorticoids, into the reactive homeostasis range, but we survive the stimulus, we bring it right back down into the predictive homeostasis range, and we keep going about our business. No problem. We could see a larger stressor, and we could have a larger response, but still, no problem. We didn't get into homeostatic overload, and we're just going to be just fine. We could have a stronger stressor at a different time of year, so that we start from a lower baseline, we still have the same kind of response, but if we looked at these individuals in the wild, we'd see a big difference in their responses. But really, it's the same response just from a different time of year. So that's what we're thinking about in terms of normal stress responses. The problem is, as Hans Selye said, every stress leaves an indelible scar and the organism pays for its survival after a stressful situation becoming a little older. In other words, you have to have wear and tear. It costs the organism, the animal, something to keep, to, to move its um, mediators into that reactive scope range. And let me give you a, a, a sort of an analogy from economics. Say that you have a car. It's got four tires. And you have $2,000 in the bank. And <clears throat> if you blow that tire and it costs you $700 to replace the tire, that's fine. It's, it's, a, it's, you know, it's not fun, but you're able to cope with it just fine because you have the money to do so. If you have a second one, you can still cope, but it's becoming, your, your buffer is, is really low. And then that third one, now you've exceeded your buffer and now you're in trouble. And that's what wear and tear is. So the way we can model it, this is, your, this is basically your buffer, your reactive scope. And you have that response, and the response is fine. You come back down, no problem. But what happens if it continues? And you have a long-term stressor. And at that point, you start to see, we'll start to see a decrease in the threshold between reactive homeostasis and homeostatic overload. Our buffer is decreasing. Our, our, um, to use the analogy again, the amount that's in your bank account has decreased and decreased and decreased. Now, in this case, the stressor ends prior to going uh, crossing this threshold, and so you're fine. And now you can start to rebuild your stores. You can rebuild your bank account. So if this happens again, you're still okay. But what happens if you like a stronger stressor that keeps going? Now you start to see that wear and tear, but now you go over into pathology. And that's not going to kill the animal immediately, but now all of a sudden, all of these uh, mediators that are designed to help you sustain and, and survive the stimulus are now causing problems on their own. And now you're in a situation of homeostatic overload, and it's because of the wear and tear on the individual. And we can start to explain, using this model, some differences between individuals over time. So for example, this is an individual that went into homeostatic overload, but when the stimulus ended, it was able to rebuild its stores and recover its reactive scope. So it's very resilient in reactive scope. So that when another stressor happens later in life or later during the year, no problem, it can cope just fine. Whereas this individual, it was unable to recover its reactive scope. It was not particularly resilient. And so now over the course of time, it, it has this lower reactive scope. It has a lower buffer. And now that same stimulus will end up going directly into homeostatic overload. And you can start to understand, uh, model, using this kind of a model, a lot of the things that are happening both in the wild and in some of the uh, human medicine. Essentially, what this model is saying is that here's our dynamic equilibrium that I showed you earlier. And we can balance this dynamic equilibrium with two lemmings, or we can balance it with two elephants. In both cases, this individual is in balance, but this individual with the elevance is in much, it has much less of a buffer. 
and even a little bit more will completely disturb it. And so it is at higher risk than this individual. And that's what the reactive scope model can start to model for you. And then finally, what happens when the pathology takes place so your wear and tear gets to the point and this buffer gets essentially zero. Now all of a sudden you can't even sustain any, any increase in, in this media is gonna cause problems. At that point, we postulate that the whole system collapses into failure and the individual dies. Why this is interesting is that we have this response over time, and this is the first model that's ever been proposed that gives an, even an inkling of how we might be able to predict the timing of problems with stress. All right, so I'd like to, to, to just talk about one example of how we can apply this, and that's the idea of starvation. And this is some of the work that I've done, especially with Martin Wachelski uh, in the Galapagos Islands, right off the coast, coast of South America. And this is uh, the marine iguanas that we were studying, and they feed on this wonderful algae that's in the uh, subtitle and in the intertitle. And they come down every day and eat all this wonderful algae. And then an El Nino hits, and there's nothing for them to eat. And so here's a picture of an El Nino um, a, a iguana during an El Nino. This is where they uh, store their fat. And you can see it's virtually all gone. And they don't even have enough energy in the skin to keep their spines up. This individual is in serious problem. And uh, you know, the El Nino that we're looking at for these data uh, lasted about 18 months. So for 18 months, these individuals had virtually nothing to eat. And when we looked at the data of looking at a body condition index compared to corticosterone, the green dots here are in a normal year. And so the body condition is quite high and their corticosterone levels are quite low. During an El Nino, however, two interesting things happen. Some of the individuals still have a fairly high body condition and their uh, corticosterone levels are low. But when they cross this threshold of about 35 in body condition, we see this huge increase in corticosterone levels. And we think this uh, body condition index of 35 is roughly the equivalent of entering stage three of starvation, for those of you who are interested in starvation stuff. But that's not particularly important at this point. The idea, though, is that these, uh, during an El Nino, when they get bad, their corticosterone levels will increase. But... Same, you know, here we are in the Galapagos. These individuals are trying to survive this El Nino, and some of them are alive and some of them are dead. Now, this individual is not doing very well. You know, there's not a lot of fat here, but still alive. And yet, they're these two individuals were facing the exact same conditions and the same stressor. What what can predict, what explains why one of these individuals succumbed and the other didn't? The traditional model provides absolutely zero help on this because the same stressors, there's the same predictability, same controllability as in uncontrollable, even allostasis, for those of you who think about this in terms of energy, they're all faced exactly with the same lack of energy. But how can you predict which one of these did it? So we did a study looking at a, the typical response to a stressor where you have the glucocorticoid levels have a lag time. So this is the baseline levels, then they increase, and then eventually through negative feedback, come back down. So what we did was we did a prospective evaluation of the stress response in these animals. So we measured, we caught an animal, we looked at it, measured its baseline levels of corticosterone. We then held it for about 30 minutes and looked at, this, at the response to the stress of capture and handling. We then in, uh, injected a, a a drug called dexamethasone, which stimulates negative feedback to figure out how good their negative feedback system was. And then we could give them another drug called ACTH, which stimulates corticosterone release to see what the maximal possible response that individual had. So we characterized all four of these aspects of their stress response and then let them back out on the beach and waited for an El Nino to occur. And about, an hour, about a year, year and a half later, a reasonably uh, moderate El Nino happened, and it killed about a third of our igu iguanas that we had measured. And so about two thirds survived, about a third lived, and then we could ask, okay, from a year and a half earlier, what we had their responses, what predicted who lived and who died? And I tell you, it had nothing to do with their baseline levels. 
It had nothing to do with their response to stress. It had nothing to do with their maximal capacity to respond. The only thing that predicted it was the negative feedback. And here's the data. So these are the stress-induced levels, and these are after negative feedback in those individuals that ended up living and those individuals that ended up dying. And so here's the normal response. When you had a very strong negative feedback response, you are more likely to live. When you had a very weak negative feedback response, you were more likely to die. So in other words, these were the individuals that were most at risk. So it's not that their negative lack of negative feedback or their weak negative feedback killed them, but they were most at risk from dying from the El Nino that occurred later. So how do we explain that? So here's the explanation we can use through the reactive scope model. So if we think about this response, here's the onset of food loss. And what we did was we didn't look at the response to the lack of food. We're just looking at the response to being captured and handled. Now, if there was a difference in their baseline levels, that would have been essentially the equivalent of going from this level to this level. So levels one and levels two. And we can see from the reactive scope model, we don't predict that that would have any effect anyhow because it's all still within the predicted homeostasis range. Similarly, a difference in the stress-induced levels would be the equivalent of an animal going to level three or to level four. That would be here, level three, level four. Again, it doesn't have any impact on the reactive scope model. It's just a slightly stronger response that's gonna come right back down. And similarly, so, something like level five, we're looking at maximal response, it's all going to be in the same realm. So the reactive scope predicts that there's not going to be any impact, any difference between these three measures. But the, the negative feedback is very different. So in this case, negative feedback means that we're going to have a lengthened response. And that lengthened response means that it's going to take, going to um, be around longer before it comes back down. And that will stimulate more wear and tear. And so what we see is that the individuals that can't turn off the stress response are actually predicted to have more wear and tear, and that makes them more vulnerable down here when we actually measure them, and they either some are alive and some are dead. So the reactive scope allows us to, to start to do that. Okay. So I'd just like to finish my talk thinking about the evolution of stress studies. So let's go back in history. The whole thing starts really at the beginning of the 1900s, where Cannon introduced the concept of fight or flight. And so lots of people talked about fight or flight, and it's now become really the standard way of thinking about really acute uh, responses to stress. And then a little bit later, back in the 1930s, Selye coins the term stress, but realizes that he makes, later in life, he, made it, he realized that he made a major mistake. So stress was a term that he had borrowed from engineering. And later in life, he realized that the concept he was really thinking about was strain, not stress. So we keep thinking about stress now, and it's an incredibly um, popular topic. And yet, really, what we're talking about is strain, not stress. But regardless, glucocorticoids at this point take the center stage, primarily because that's what Cellier was studying and, and came up with these ideas. So everything starts to become about glucocorticoids. And people start realizing it's all about predictability and controllability. But there are about the recurring problems. And those problems are, first of all, glucocorticoid effects are very complicated. It's really difficult to figure out what glucocorticoids are doing and why they're helping in this concept that we call stress. Second of all, stress theories are mostly post hoc. They're not predictive. I mean, it's, it blows me, blows me away. We've been thinking about stress for over 100 years now, and we have two individuals in a car, and they get into a car accident. We still have no idea how to predict if one, the other, both, or neither will start to suffer from PTSD. So all of this stuff on stress has basically been post hoc. And then also, wild animals don't respond like lab rats. And so if we're going to try to come up with ideas of how stress works, we can't just be working with lab rats. And so starting about 30 years ago, we start to get allostasis, and allostasis changes the focus to energy balance as being used a lot in biomedicine right now, and especially human medicine, and is making an enormous difference. People are now starting to talk about allostasis rather than stress. And then we produce the, the reactive scope model, which focuses on wear and tear. 
And then what's next? Where do we go from here? And so Barry Marshall once said that everything that's supposedly caused by stress, I tell people there's a Nobel Prize there if you find out the real cause. Now, Barry Marshall did win a Nobel Prize, so he ought to know. But I just want to point out all these you know, students and postdocs out there are thinking about this. Think about working on stress and work on, towards your Nobel Prize because it's probably out there. And as you do so, just keep in mind one other quote, which is that stress is like spice. In the right proportion, it enhances the flavor of a dish. Too little produces a bland, dull meal, but too much may choke you. So thank you for paying attention. I hope that that was understandable.